reading the horse, what it is, why it matters, and I've got myself a little prop today. This is a foot that I got from my friend Thomas in Finland, and he made this thing very, very helpful. And there's a lot going on. There's a whole lot going on that if you have this thing to think about when you're watching horses try to change leads and move around and and they look like they're not doing well, it's very likely that you've got something happening in there that could be this way or this way. You could have an angle that the foot is going straight down and the pastern is not in line with the dorsal wall on the hoof. There's a whole lot of things to think about inside that leg. So I'm kind of hoping that people are going to start to think more about how they can help the horse than how they can really firm up and train them extra hard to get some desired results, okay? Because chances are the horse is doing the very best he can. And by the way, for those of you starting on here, I'll just let you know if this thing keeps cutting out and I can see many more of these signs that says reconnecting uh, signal lost, I am going to bail out and do it tomorrow where I know I have a solid signal up there in um, Missoula. All right, so I won't waste any more time talking about that. Uh, but <clears throat> that'll drive me to distraction in short order because I forget where I am. So here we have, this is called P3, right here, okay? This is a very important bone, and right behind it sits the navicular bone. So when people say, oh, he's got navicular, sure he does. He's got this little navicular bone that sits right here underneath your coffin bone. See that one? This is just a rubber tube. He's not any part of that. Now, right here, you have your your navicular bone and above it what you're looking at is the uh, P2 this is the short pastern bone it's also called this is your longer pastern bone called P1 behind here the back of your fetlock these are called sesamoid bones okay right here you don't want to have imbalanced or uneven feet or long or too short toes because a back foot can crack these things up here you have your cannon bone, and right here are your two splint bones. Now the, the theory and the rumor is that these splint bones used to be part of or connected to the uh, early eohippus, mesohippus, whoever hippus. I don't have all my uh, historical, um, you know, uh, Neanderthal type horses right at the tip of my tongue. I have notes on all that and I know where to find it. You can get on the uh, internet and find it too. But right at this moment, these sometimes break, they sometimes crack, and you can see that they are not really a, a, a broken splint bone or a popped splint bone or somebody will say, oh, he popped a splint. What that really means is that when you see these calcified breaks here or something happened in rough play or he fell or he got a back foot tied up in here somehow, he, uh, they can snap these things and they'll just recalcify and reattach and it. It really is kind of okay. I don't think it's so nice if you're the horse, but it's not going to be any long-term structural difficulties. Now, something very disappointing, in my opinion, has happened on my Facebook site. And I don't know what to do about it. Maybe somebody can tell me, but I don't find these featured albums anymore. I had some hoof, hoof albums and hoof pictures and I had... Uh, my whole hoof sketchbook is gone. I don't know where it went. So if somebody can find it, please tell me where it is because I don't see it. I don't know how to find it. I'm so frustrated I can hardly stand it. They're just a few, just a smattering of hoof pictures. None of the ones with my descriptions or any of my, um, uh, uh, the, the notes that I wrote and so on. That's all gone. It's quite disturbing. I can reload it, but I'm not going to do reload it too many times if it keeps going to fly the coop like that. Anyway, I'm, I'm very interested in input. So here's one of the things that I'm really thinking about. That I was just at a place, this is why I was late. I walked in and a lot of nice people. It was an indoor arena. They were, they had, they were roping a little cat, do a little calf roping. And uh, so it's um, really... Okay, Sally, I'll try it. See if you can find it uh, if, for me because it'll be days before I get to that. I'm uh, horribly sorry. 
But anyway, if somebody can find it, just tell me what it, what happened to it. So while I was at this place, a good friend of mine, known him a long time, he's a very nice man. His name's John Ensign. And he came up, and well, there were some other people there. It was just a, a lovely collection of people and horses and real interested in doing the right thing with their with everything, their leg aids, their rain aids, their timing. It was just a pleasure to watch the care with which they were handling their animals and um, just a really nice, sincere effort going into ev from everybody toward every horse there. It's just a, it's lovely when you see that. But anyway, a couple of these horses were standing without their heels on the ground and they were having trouble with lead changes as well, the same horses. And I want to explain why that happens because you can, yes, you can, uh, you can actually put a great amount of stress on yourself and on your horse by not being able to read the way they're using their feet on the ground. Now, it's very often that when people take shoes off around here in the fall, I'm going to put this down now. Uh, it's very often when people take shoes off in the fall and they let the horses go, say, from Thanksgiving to Easter or something like that, it's very often that you can unfortunately just think that nature's going to take care of it well people who are riding their horses a lot are going to probably need maybe a little support for those feet or maybe some boots people who don't ride at all are going to need pretty much to get after that length and growth because 16 weeks four months of growth even if you think your horse is just hanging out it so fundamentally changes what he can do with his hips and his and his shoulders the alignment you, we must remember that the shoulders are not connected by skeletons. They don't have collarbones like we do, okay? So uh, they just have soft tissue, muscle, ligament, tendon, all of the structures that are involved with setting that horse up on four legs. It must be remembered that one of the reasons that they are so agile and so uh, successful in surviving 50 million years of uh occasional misfortune or wipeouts or disease or natural disasters is because they can run like the devil. They can go as fast as they want and <clears throat> part of what allows them to do that, get that extra reach in each stride of progression is the fact that they're not locked down by a couple collarbones right here. Those horses can go straight out like this and also, as I told you in an earlier thing, they can go straight out like this. You remember I told you about one horse I had that fell flat down on a trailer and got the insides of his bulbs of his heels and the insides of his shoes caught right on a ramp. Now he had his back feet going out just like a puppy on the rug and the, just you bring home a five-week-old puppy and they sack out and their little back feet go out. That's just how that horse looked. It didn't do his stifles any good, but it didn't do his shoulders any harm. That's the point that I want to make. So when we start to think about riding and riding and riding these horses and maybe maybe the saddles fit all the time maybe they don't maybe we sit kind of heavy in our butt and we don't distribute our weight nicely around the rib cage there are a lot of small things that can get a horse to begin to overuse and misuse his back feet so what can happen is you can wear a horse down and you can you can wear a hoof down to the point where you've actually got your horse with no heel buttresses left no support from the actual uh, everything from the quarters on back is just almost pink. That's it's not uncommon. I've, I've seen that kind of recently. So you get a frog high, and then you get the bulbs of the heels slipping down underneath. So he's actually walking on this. So when that happens, what he ends up doing is saying pretty much, ouch. Okay, ouch. So he's going to do here, and he's just going to go toe first, so that he doesn't have to go heel first and have your combined weight standing on that very sensitive skin that's right underneath that hairline, the coronet band, as it comes underneath this heel. So on some horses, when you start to see, if you pick them up and you can see that the frog has sort of started to blend in with the bulbs of the heel flattening out and slipping underneath, you want to remember that your lead changes are going to be tough. A lot of your athletic maneuvers are going to be almost impossible for him because he's going to have to tiptoe right around here not to feel the pressure on that skin. Skin is not meant to have any kind of thrust function or downward weight-bearing function, five, six hundred kilos 
on that skin is, is quite a bit too much, okay? So as they, over time, incrementally, if the feet are not tended to or if the way that they're being used either, this is two things that cause this now. Sometimes it's just overusing a hoof that's already too short with no heels, but it changes the angle on the horse's entire structure. He's connected to the ground from his pelvis all the way to the floor, right there. That's a hard, that's a hard structure. But the minute you begin to have him on his toes, his tail lifts up, his pelvis tips forward, it changes his ability to breathe properly. Not only when he does that, the back of your saddle starts to dig right into the lumbar vertebrae. He's got a lumbar section that's behind your candle where your butt is, right to the hip. You have the back of your western saddle digging down in there because his hip is now raised up because his toe is up, his toe is down to keep his heel off the ground. This becomes quite a problem. So I want you to start, there's many other things we could talk about reading a horse that would have to do with his reaction to changes in his social life or to his feed. I'm right now just going to focus on this because suddenly, to be honest, in the last couple of years, I don't have so many riding students anymore like I used to because... So many of those horses can't really carry weight anymore in a nice way. They're just not set up. The kind of awareness that old time vets used to have and old time fairies used to have and farmers and backyard horse owners used to have was just quite a bit broader. Okay, now that is annoying as can be. Just wait. I'm walking now. I gotta find another place to do this. Hang on. I'm going to do this over here by this barbecue. Just hang out there now for a minute. This makes me so mad. It's the second here. I'm going to have to find... Okay, here. I, got, I think I got it. Just a minute. I'm going to probably have to hold this darn thing. Here's a barbecue right here next to this house. Hold on here. Just a minute. This is enough to make you mad as can be. There. Now, I think I... Uh, see this house here? That's going to be where I'm going to catch a signal, I think. There's the mountains. Really pretty out here. Okay. You still here, everybody? I am so sorry. Anyway, we got this nice barbecue right here. I'm going to lean right up against it. I think i got to have to hold this thing. Okay. So I don't have two hands now. I'm holding this. Where in the world was I? Mm. I just hate it when that happens. Hang on. i got to get my mind back. All right, well, look, here we go. I'm just going to pick up with this um, discussion about horses that are having trouble following the field to liven up. Now, one of the main things you're going to see, let me tell you how this concrete is not warm. Wow. Mm. Well, here is my chair. You see this? This right here? That is my chair. You gotta do what you gotta do. Okay. So, I think this will do it. I'm sorry. I just had to get re readjusted. I really want. I don't want to miss this because I'm gonna miss my pace uh, on the next ones and the next ones. I don't want to have to go like I did last week and do one a day. That was okay. Thank you for watching those. For those of you who uh, were part of that trailer loading. Uh, recording last Sunday um, it turned out that that went on to Monday and Tuesday and a couple of sessions on Wednesday and then on Thursday so Jackson you're gonna have your hands full on that one but I think it was important because uh, many of you wrote in and told me that there were some important aspects there that you hadn't thought about I need to figure out how I'm doing this now so I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to Okay, let's see if we can do this. Same boots. Can you believe it? Okay, there we go. There, that does it. So, all right, so when you're looking at a horse standing around at a branding, at a clinic, at the judge's circle, lining up to back up, any of these things where you're going to see a whole collection of horses, uh, you start to notice how many of them are standing there, heavy on the front, right hip cocked back behind them 
They are asked to move. The back feet never leave the ground. Today and many other days, I see a two, three, four foot scrape in the dirt when a horse is asked to just follow a field to lead off or maybe turn around and just go in kind of a little semicircle so that someone can finish talking to somebody or whatever adjustment they're making. All of these things indicate that the horse has not got adequate strength and coordination between his adductors, which is the inside of the legs all the way up to the groin, that whole panel of muscles. Of course, there are many other muscles that are tied into this whole thing. I'm not going to get too technical at the moment. We can address all this later. In fact, I'm working on a featured album on Facebook to present to you. So better quit removing it. Um, and you have many other legs, uh, muscles going right up the legs. You've got your Gaskin section of the leg. That's got a lot of muscles that get short and tight right up on the inside of the, the, the panel that is would be what you'd consider, say, right from the point of the hip down, the, 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 point, the big joints. I still can't remember what those are called. The hips are up where hips are, but that joint that's back on either side of the tail, I forget what that joint is called. But anyway, you got a whole very complex and important set of muscles that goes from there right down the inside of the leg toward the hock, and it attaches in there. And when these horses are just about not using that right hip because of the way they're handled or many other things concerning the kind of hoof care they have, you're going to get a really couple of hard cables of muscle going straight down the inside of that horse, right next, right in, right just on the inside of his tail. You can reach in there and feel it. And these things, when these horses are standing like this for too long and their feet condition, their hoof conditions are not addressed either from the heel being too high. Okay, the heel being too high and them having to stand like this because they've got a big block here or the heel being too low. And so really they would be here perhaps like this. But as a matter of fact, because there's no more heel left on the hoof, the, the, the heel bulbs that were here slip down underneath and become weight bearing. And that horse will say, ouch, and stand up like that. So whether the heel is too far removed or far too long, you're going to get a very similar effect. The thing you want to be careful not to do with those big heels is to drop them down too suddenly so that you don't get the deep digital flexor tendon and some of these other very essential support structures so stretched out like a rubber band that they start to fray. That When they say, oh, he's got navicular very often, what they're talking about is that that bone right there suddenly has such a tight tendon across it that this bone begins to just cut through that tendon sheath and it just starts to fray it like a rope, okay? It's extremely dangerous and very, very sore for them. I, I say dangerous, I mean, tendons can heal up and they certainly don't heal up if they break very well. But um, you, they, they can get repaired. But we wanna be mindful that before we start training on a horse and spurring him and jerking him and saying he's some useless thing and he needs a better trainer and this and that, you wanna be quite sure that the way you're asking him to liven up and be a good boy and deliver your results, you've got to look down and see what it is he's actually standing on and whether he actually can do this. Because the more they're on their toes behind, the steeper that angle you get at 65, 75, 85, 95 degree angle on these back feet, you've got a horse that is in unspeakable discomfort all through his whole body. And to the best he can, he's trying to do the whole thing for you right on the front feet. Whoops, my phone's slipping down there right along. There we are. He's trying to do the whole thing for you on the front feet. And the problem with that is <laughs> if you want him to be light and handy and snappy and make you look like the rider you probably are, which is a good rider who's looking for a horse that can respond, you want to make sure that he's got a place that he's confident putting the weight. He can't give you a light forehand unless he's got a place to put the weight. And if he can't use both back heels, or even if he suddenly can, but the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles are too wadded up and tight from having his heels raised up like this, those things start to contract over a winter standing around or over any amount of time. So I want you to be mindful when you see these big scrapes in the ground. You got a horse that is walking, landing toe first. It's got sh little shiny, little shiny moon shape on the front of his hooves, front or back or all four. These are horses that need attention in the hoof care and in the body work. These are not horses that need a spanking or rode hard, put up wet and a bad rap for not being good or understanding you. I think probably they understand you just fine. But they're always gonna leave a little signal for you 
and, and this will before they buck you off. Some of them are even in too much discomfort to bother. They just put up with it. But let's just talk about what we can do besides pick up the feet and say, oh no, she was right, look at this. We can do a lot else. <sighs> let's just say you get on a schedule that you're gonna commit. You brush your teeth every night. Okay, if you don't brush your teeth once a day, you're off the hook. There are a lot of people you could maybe say that about, but you brush your teeth, take care of your horse's feet. You take a look in there. If you're gonna ride them, pick up a hoof and look at each one, please. If you're gonna ride them out, please pick up a hoof and look under each one when you're done so you don't leave some three quarter inch angulated, chipped up, sharp rock in there for them to deal with in the frog or in the jammed up in the collateral grooves of the frog and so forth. And just a little more mindful because you want them to give you their 100%. It's just gonna be another couple minutes, you can bend down and ask for a foot and then you're gonna have that knowledge that, okay, at least right now there's no rocks in there. Everything looks well. We don't have some big stick stuck up in the frog there. We've checked we don't have thrush. We've checked that we've got, they've got uh, white line separation, that lamellar pressure from toes that have been too long or whatever it is. You don't wanna have just say, oh, well, my, my fairy's coming in six weeks. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Maybe he moves away. Maybe he has a flat tire getting to your place and it's another eight weeks. You need to really start to just put your own horse's foot right in the front of your face. In your mind, please do it, okay? There's no reason in the world. I have a friend the other day, guess what he did? He was riding a dressage horse and we've been talking about feet and he's been asking me some questions and he's been learning quite a bit lately. He's been watching me do some things that just the slightest little thing you can just actually just do some rasping on horses that have almost lost their value as, as far as performance goes. You can rasp off less than a quarter of a cup of hoof, just a powder, eighth of a cup of powder, and you do the right rasping job and those horses will, will go on sound. So that got him to thinking the other day and he found out that that horse was in extreme sciatic pain and had two high points on both back feet. I can't remember what else he said something else, some other details, something with the bars or something. But anyway, he nailed it. Got off the horse, gave him a pet, put him up. He's gonna take care of it tomorrow. See, that's the kind of thing we wanna start doing for our horses, I think. Makes it a lot more, uh, I would say just, it sort of connects you really to the world the horse lives in. And he really can never understand our world from our point of view. So it's almost incumbent upon us to try to shift our, uh, our love of the horse and our you know, have our shift in our perspective driven by our, our attraction to or love of or dependency on horses, whatever we do, whether we're race horse riders or veterinarians or trainers or just young kids just loving horses. Just get under there and look at those feet because those feet are as important to the, uh, to, to the well-being and the future of your animal and also your safety, by the way, and your children's safety. I cannot emphasize that enough. And Tori was right, no foot, no horse. That's the oldest thing you can have. Back to the Byzantine era when they were, ah, they were gassing around in those chariots, they knew that. That's for sure. That's why the first thing, one of the first things that was done with iron was to put it on the feet of those oxen. First, one of the very first things they did when they got that Iron Age started coming across, digging up all that iron ore and figuring out what to do with it, they made shoes for the oxen and the horses. You can put all the training you want on a horse and have him just ready to go. You can have 10 of them ready to go. And if they can't walk, they can't operate in a proper fashion, they'll do their best. You can beat them until there's nothing left of your whip. They can't walk, they can't walk. So let's not let that happen. Okay, I've, hit, I've done that topic enough for the moment, I think. I wanna talk about another effect that does come from, I will just say, oversights on hoof care. I could be uh, using other words. I will mention these words, but I don't feel these words because I don't think that the intent to operate this way is true. We could call it neglect. We could call it carelessness. We could call it 
abdication of responsibility. We could do, use a lot of $10 words to say that you're not taking care of your horse's feet right, you're not taking care of your horse's feet right. It cannot be the farrier's responsibility exclusively or your hoof care person's responsibility. It is a day-to-day -day relationship the horse has with the ground, and if you have the opportunity to be with him, that's your moment to check in and see how he's really doing. Not give him a pat on the head, love on him, jam a carrot in there, clean his stall. That's all part of it, too, for you. It's okay. It's not as important as checking underneath those feet and seeing what's going on and walking him out. If he's in that stall too long, they need exercise, okay? It's very, very important not to let these horses stand in a stall loaded up on the forehand with their head in the aisle looking left and right all day long or just looking at the guy in front of them because the blood and the toxins pool in those feet, okay? It makes circulation challenging. It makes toxin elimination challenging. It makes a lot of things challenging. It makes the health of the muscles and the kidney and the liver challenging. The whole thing about the horse is to move. And when we box them up in another situation, it is really and truly our obligation and our, 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 our best move for our own safety, too, and for the goals you want to reach. If you want to jump high or win the dressage or you've got horses in training at the track, for heaven's sakes, borrow the money from the bank and put a hot walker up there that they can walk in when they're loose. They don't have to be tied to the bloody thing. Let them just cruise around and get that exercise if you're too busy. That's okay. We all are busy. It's not, we're not going to start criticizing people who are busy, but it, there is just a, an added measure, I would say, on horses that are not kept outside and free to roam and free to play and have a kind of normal life where they get the right circulation and enough up and down with their neck while they're playing with other horses or able to nose around on the ground and see what's what. You know, this is really important to their mental and physical health and to their dental occlusion. We want to make sure we understand how important it is that the arcades of those teeth are also checked and that you understand and begin to look and read the signs of teeth that are not working right. A TMJ that is out. You have a problem with a TMJ, you've got a problem with those feet in the back. You've got a problem with your hip. You've got a problem with your breathing. You've got a problem with your turns and your alignment and the horse's thinking and availability. His emotional and mental availability is not going to be working too well any more than it would to you if you had an, a tooth abscess or you couldn't unlock your jaw. So these are the signs we want to start to look at so that we can pass these on to our friends and our children, our students, and we can do a better job uh, with the uh, information that we have um, available to us and that is really not very available as I've found. Very, you know, I don't find that a lot of people are teaching this way. <laughs> And I'm not saying it's the only way or the best way, but I'm trying to fill in a couple of gaps here so that I can get back to giving riding lessons. Um, if I can figure out how to kind of bring up a little bit more awareness on the part of everybody and, and get people to make a different kind of relationship with their farriers and their trimmers so that there's not such a, you know, you sure don't want to go out and tell your hoof care guy that you know more than he does because you listen to Leslie Desmond for 10 minutes. Please don't start that. Don't do me any favors like that. That's not where we're supposed to head with this. I'm just trying to make sure that you uh, are aware that there is no one size fits all with the hoof care, with the vetting, with the dental work. Every single profession that is, is overlapped by other professions or, or with which we are intertwined to best take care of our horses. Let's, let's just talk about a few of them now. We have the people who uh, provide footing for the arenas. Those are very important people. Are you having an arena out there that you can afford to have hay drop on or is that footing too toxic for a horse to have in his body? It's an important thought before you spend that money. Um, I did have the opportunity in England or Ireland to be in one place that it was quite, I don't know what they had in there, but boy oh boy it made some horses awful sick. So you want to make sure that whether it's your footing you're looking at your barn and stall design, how you're going to drain the spilled water and urine out of your stalls, or are you going to have the kind of cleanup and maintenance that will keep those horses thrush free and take all the nastiness out of there so that their coats and their skin doesn't get all bungled up? These are things that most people, you know, oh, good, we got a little ranch, we got a little ranch yet, we got this little barn here, that's great, going to keep the rain off. But maybe what he's lying in, you wish it, you'd have a thunderstorm every day. Imagine that. 
you got something on the ground or out where he can roll every day and it's so bad for his skin and for his nostrils and his breathing set up that you just wish you had a rainstorm every day, a tsunami even. These are things, very, very many of them, and I must say it, we're going to talk about in your regions where you've got horses pastured on grass. Don't go to bed feeling super fine until you understand the mineral content of your soil, please, that's producing these feeds, okay? It's wonderful that they can walk around and it's wonderful that they've got their heads down, but we have dental care and we have the choice of where, what kind of fencing to use. All of these things will combine in the end to either create more work for you and more expense or less. You're going to have many easier nights as a horse owner or many more distraught, you know, distressful and you will be more distraught, you'll have more anxiety and you're going to say, I didn't know what I didn't know. I wish there was a book we could go to somewhere that had all this in it, but that book would probably be too heavy to carry around. Um, I just want to point out the basic things, your ring footing, your choice of fencing, how you're maintaining the feet, whether or not your saddles fit. You might think of saddle fit. You call one person you have been referred to as a saddle fitter, call another one. See what that person says. You're very often what one person thinks fit, another person can prove to you does not fit. Um, so if you're going to go spend four or $5,000 on a saddle, English or Western, dressage jumping or what have you, you're going to pay the person who's building that saddle to tell you it fits? I'm sorry, there are a lot of wonderful saddle people out there and honest people out there. Get a second opinion so you don't spend your money. And remember that horses' backs change. You can have a perfectly fit horse and a perfectly fit saddle and a perfectly honest and accurate saddle fitter and you can be riding that spine for three months with a drop nose man and you will have a different top line and you might have a horse that doesn't work for you at all anymore. That jaw needs to be loose for the pole to be available, for lateral flexion to be possible, for the pressure on the optic nerves and many other nerves that are essential to proper digestion. If you start imp impacting salivation, you start impacting digestion. All of the enzymes that are available in the mouth and that produce a proper start on your digestive process in the mouth and all the way down, if you start to impact the salivary process so that they are spitting all over themselves like they've been at the dentist for a week and a half and didn't have any spit cup. Listen, I've heard dressage people, I've overheard dressage people say in the winning circle, oh well, they call it flecking or something else. I don't know what else they call it. I call it, he's drooling all over himself and uh, it's unattractive. He's got his nose band so tight, his tongue is blue. I have seen this with these eyes. I hope this is not being done anymore. I don't know what to do about it except just bring it to your attention and say that there's no amount of pressure on that jaw that's going to give you an engaged hip, an elevated set of ribs and withers, a willing frame of mind and shoulders that know what to do. I believe that and I've seen it and I just want to caution you not to be judgmental too much on yourself or on your friends because it's very hard, it's very emotional for me too. I've been watching this all my life. I remember one day down at Maddow's in Canaan, Russ if you're on there you know what I'm talking about, you were there, you and Ellie. They pulled a saddle off a horse down there that horse had no skin. Not one piece of skin on there. It was just a raw back. It looked like it was unbelievable. Anyway, the horses are at our mercy, and we can only try to. I remember the guy. He said, "Oh, everybody gasped, and people, a couple kids started to cry, and oh, it was a mess." Anyway, this was at the end of summer camp. These were horses that were coming back through out of the summer through the auction yard. Probably that one didn't go to a very good home. Maybe he did. I hope so. I had to rebalance this phone in my boot. There we go. So that day they pulled the saddle off in the auction yard. I can't remember if he had any hair under his stomach or not, or down where the cinch was, but I know that where that saddle sat, there was no skin. It was just flesh. And then the guy, I won't, well, it was Maddow's auction down there on Route 44 outside Canaan. And the guy said, oh, listen, people, people, just relax. Haven't you ever fell and skinned your knee? <laughs> yeah, I have, actually. 
Anyhow, I guess that was the only thing you could do was make light of it. Um, he was hoping to get some good money for the horse or a good home. I don't know what, but anyway, he had to sell that horse and he did his best. And But anyway, it left a lasting impression on me, which is that um, it's very easy to criticize what someone does, but what if that riding program, like so many programs that are happening right now in therapeutic riding, what if that riding program was run by a non-horse person? What if that person didn't know she needed a saddle blanket? What if that person didn't understand what rain rot was? Don't assume too much. I really think in most cases, more than 90% of the cases, 99, I'd even go that far. I think people involved with horses really love them. I have to think that, otherwise I go berserk. Uh, if I'd thought otherwise, I don't think I could hang in here. But I think people are not that different than I am. I think, I don't, I'm a little bit different than some of you, but I think really in the end of it, if you like horses, you like horses, and you're going to try to do what you can for them. It gets harder and harder for people who really like horses when other people criticize them. I know that because I've been criticized, and I know that because I've done a lot of criticism, and it's not a good idea. I've learned the hard way that the best way to help somebody who is doing not what they should or not what they have the potential to do is to help them see what it is that's missing. Don't make them feel embarrassed. Try to set it up in a gentle way. Offer to help them. Now, this is hard because some people don't want help. But we'll get down to the other matters, like keeping your horse clean. I've seen lots and lots of well-bred well horses, well-kept horses, but then underneath that tail, what a mess. Mares, what a mess. I'm going to just say it like this to the men and to the women. You keep that horse as clean as you keep yourself. Leave it right there. And if you don't know how to do it, you talk to a vet or you find out online. There's plenty of information about how to keep your mare clean if she's got an infection and what to do and who to call and whatnot. You can get them flushed out. You can get them some antibiotics. You can take away the reason. Sometimes uh, these mares are turned out with a, a stallion that's dirty. They'll get all kinds of mess going on. Now you must read the horses and the signs of when they need your help and, and you take the action. Your geldings that are standing around with all that scaly stuff peeling off them when they let down, please. Like I said, you keep your, your mothers who have children, you keep, you keep your horses, please, as clean as you keep your family. It's really the only way to say it because the horse doesn't appreciate being left dirty. Who would? That's one sign. Okay, and it can get to the point where in the summertime some of these horses can't really function properly because flies get up in there. When you leave all that stuff on there, the flies get up in there and many other things start to happen that is a lot less than okay. So let's just make sure that you're not embarrassed about that. I'm not going to get too explicit on here because you guys know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, well, someone can tell you. Just have them listen and then if you're confused, they'll explain it to you. Not going to get too much into that right now. This is not a medical show. <clears throat> Horses that don't clean up their feed, there's your sign. Horses that aren't interested in food, once a day, twice a day at least, there's another sign. Yeah. Horses that don't have a spark in their eye anymore, there's a sign. Horses that have very rapid, shallow breathing, there's a sign. I want to teach you how to read your horse, okay? Horses that have one front foot stuck out all the time, there's your sign. Could be a lot of things. Not just a navicular problem or a, or a deep digital flexor tendon problem. Could be many, 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 many things. Horses do get, at the, they do bruise their coffin bone. They do crack and do have hairline fractures in their coffin bone, in their sesamoids. That's the two bones up there in the back right here behind the fetlock, okay? They do crack these from time to time. Okay, there are many, many things that can go on. You can get problems with the extensor tendon. The, ex the extensor tendon is the piece that picks up the toe. comes right down here. It's a big, broad band that comes right down the front. You have your uh, suspensories that come down around the side. <clears throat> Suspensory. So there are many, many things to be aware of, and there's free information all over the place. Now, 
for those of you who are on here, perhaps for the first time or maybe the second time, it doesn't matter how many times, but if you haven't gone on iTunes and checked out something that's called um, Equine Anatomy 3D, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Equine Anatomy 3D. $9.95. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. You put it right on your telephone, and that starts to give you information about how the neck is put together. Very important. Very often you'll find that horses have C3, that means cervical vertebrae, number three. There are seven between the pole and the root of the neck where it attaches to the front of the sternum between the shoulders. Okay, that column of vertebrae, you guys, is very, very easy to get out of alignment. And if you're only handling your horse on the left, he's very likely to have C2 or C3 or C4 out. How do you know? When you run your hands down that neck, if it's smooth and you just feel a nice neck, could be that that's a nice neck. You have a nice neck too when it's out of alignment because it can be a nice neck. Again, easy for him to work. More, uh, He can give you a, 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 a more accurate and a more prompt response if his neck is in alignment. You can feel when his neck is out of alignment. You'll start to feel bulges where, what kind of a picture is this? You'll start to feel bulges when your hand goes down that neck like this. It's just like you have your hand. It feels like a, maybe it feels like a tennis ball kind of under three blankets or five blankets or something. It's not just a huge big ball sitting out there. It's just, you can just see that it isn't smooth. It's not just muscles and skin and fascia over, the, over a properly aligned neck. There's, you can feel these bulges in there. So the horse will be very eager for you to start to help him with that. And very often, if they know you're interested and they can see that you have recognized that, they'll start moving right over and just kind of show you. I was working on a horse not long ago, and he just didn't want any more help on his hips. He did for a while, and I was working on the adductors for him and all that whole setup all the way around from the top of his tail right down to the inside of his hocks. He was just as tickled as could be. Until he wasn't, he turned around, he stuck his neck right in my hand and started to push. And that told me he understood exactly how to make best use of my time. So I left my hand where it was, and he moved his neck all the way around right until right until he was satisfied that he had had enough, and he yawned about five or six times and dropped his head down and went to sleep. That was quite recently, as a matter of fact. So these are small things. I'm going to get back to our list of things now in the barn that will give you a sign. One of the things that's important to understand out in the pastures, I pulled two dogs out of a water tank one day when I realized that I hadn't seen those horses drink in a while. And I also hadn't, every single horse in that place was gaunt, drawn up. When I started looking around, I figured there was a break in the pipe, and I went over there, and there were two dogs in the water tank. They'd been in there a while. So they're, they're doing some shooting over there. It's good pheasant country, I must say. I saw a lot of ring-neck pheasants this morning on my trip. I haven't seen those since 1958. I don't think they have them around where I am. Anyway, hear that? Glad I'm not the target. Anyway, all right, so back to your barn and your water supply. You want to make sure that your electricity that manages the heat to your electric waters is really, really solid so that you're not giving your horse a little shock every time he has to drink. That's important, you can imagine. There's another thing about your electricity. There are a lot of horses that know when that fence is on and when it's not on. I have a horse that'll touch his whisker right on there, and he'll see if it's on there and stick his nose out there till he has those hairs right there, and then he'll lick and chew if it's off, and he'll just to be honest, he'll look kind of disgusted if it's on. But he hasn't had to pay too big a price because they can know one whisker. I'm sure some of you have horses like that. So it is, by the way, becoming extremely cold out here. i got to see what time it is. I don't have a clock. Does anybody know what time it is? Can someone tell me by any chance? I don't have my glasses on either. I'm going to wait till somebody puts a clock up here for me. You guys know what time it is? Can somebody type that out for me, please? All right, well, I'll just keep talking then. Um, inside your barns, there are some main things to be careful of, okay? You want to, 
Uh, okay, thank you. Beautiful. That's lovely. Thanks, you guys. Um, I'm going to go another probably 10 or 15 minutes, okay? Thank you, Anna Kayla, Lisa and Tori. Thanks, you guys. Um, yeah, somehow you can forget this nice spring weather I was just enjoying out here. It has just plummeted. Um, but there are three things I'd like to say now, just in terms of reading your environment that you're going to put that horse in so that you don't have to go read the horse and figure out what this thing I'm going to tell you about will produce if you're inattentive. Anytime you go into a barn that is not yours, pens that are not yours, I want you, please, to look carefully at how those gates are hung, whether they swing in or out, whether or not before you're committed with a saddled horse going through there, particularly a western saddle, or if you have two horses in your hand and you're going to just somehow finagle that, which many, many of you can do. You can take two horses in one hand and just file them through there, no problem, particularly if they know each other, but even if they don't. Just make sure you know how heavy that gate is, whether or not the hinges are good enough so that it can swing freely, or whether you are suddenly got to manage 80 pounds when that thing is open. Okay, that's important. Does it go away from you? Does it come to you? Is there a stop on it? Can you? You never, ever, ever want to take a horse through a gate that opens in his direction without managing that gate fully yourself. Do not pass first, please, through a gate that you open in your direction and just bring the horse behind you. If that gate closes in front of his stifles or in front of his hip bones and he starts to struggle forward, or if he starts to pull back and you're not aware that he is stuck in that gate and you pull him into that, by the way, that can be the end of your horse. Just in one second, he can break his back and dis, he can just break his back and his pelvis just in a second with that move. So you want to be, gates are some of the trickiest things and it's very, very important if you've got a gate that's made of wood, an old double wood fence, maybe made out of two by sixes, eight and 10 and 12 foot two by sixes with cross braces and hanging, it is so important. I can't tell you enough how important it is. To make sure you can manage that gate in both directions with the footing. Don't just go slogging in there with your sneakers and two feet of mud and suddenly realize after you've got that gate open and the cows are coming in your direction that you've misjudged it. Get that figured out first, okay? So it's, that's enough to say about that for the moment. There's another thing about gates, and this has to do with leaving a halter on in a stall and your latches on the outside of your stalls. This is called reading a horse, why it matters, what is it and why it matters. The horse that's had his neck pulled or been suddenly jerked by the head because he puts a thousand pounds into the latch on the outside of the door because you left his halter on and his halter didn't break off or come off his head. This is going to make a tremendous uh, potential for a tremendous problem with his sinuses, with his eyes, with his ability to have a good occlusion in his jaws, with his ability to laterally flex his pole, many, many other things. It can interfere with the whole hyoid apparatus and his ability to swallow, breathe. I mean, a really, really powerful thousand pound jerk on the head in the wrong direction at the wrong angle can be a critical thing. So let's make sure that we remove as many of the opportunities as a horse has, including getting a halter caught on a bucket hook. They sell these very convenient for people, but very dangerous for horses, little things that look almost like a, a modified paper clip to hang a five, uh, three or four gallon pail of water on in the stall. Those flat backed buckets on these open hooked things with no snaps. Very convenient for the person. Very dangerous for a lip or an eyelid. Very dangerous for a halter ring. So these are things we don't want to have to try to do what they call Monday morning quarterbacking, where you've watched the game uh, you know, you were either on the winning or the losing team, rooting for the winning or the losing team, and you're telling everybody on Monday how it should have been. Don't be in that position with your horse's health and welfare, having overlooked the very simple things about your animal husbandry, your barn maintenance, your fencing. And the other thing I was going to say is when you go in to a set of pens at a showgrounds, particularly these, oh, they're the worst, these temporary stalls that are put up all over the place, for horses that are shipping in from out of town, maybe just for a weekend or something. People who are doing this are in a big hurry. They're not paid enough. 
Most of them have backs and fingers and knees and necks and everything else that isn't working all that well. These are some really hard-working, physically stressed people that are just on deadline to slam these things into position so that you can come and have your horse overnight at the show. Be careful and travel if you must with either a piece of canvas or a 2x6 or a 2x8 board with hooks on it that you can keep a foot from going under the bottom rail in a stall that is too small or in any stall. Okay, If you've got an opportunity for a horse to lie down and get a hoof stuck or maybe even just get his whole leg up under there up to his hock or up to his uh, his gaskin up by his stifle. I've seen some really avoidable things that were just a oversight, carelessness. All these things are avoidable and I don't want you to have to start looking to read the signs of horses that are permanently damaged or that are going to need nine months of rehab or rest. This happens all the time. On the subject of rest, stall rest is something that I don't like that word. I don't like that term. Uh, I don't like it because it's overused and vastly overdone and many of the horses that are put on stall rest are directed to be on stall rest by uh, well-meaning uh, animal healers and licensed veterinarians and licensed certified well-educated body workers. The thing about stall rest that is most important to understand is who is going to be taking that horse out after he's been on stall rest. Is it worth somebody's life? No. Is it worth having him get re-injured again in the first five minutes because he's going a thousand miles an hour in the wrong direction with a lead rope that someone can't hold? For my money, it wouldn't be worth it. But these are things that we want to really think about. If we're going to get stall rest, a direction for stall rest, do we have a place to keep that horse where stall rest could mean a 24-foot turnout with a friend nearby so he doesn't have to get excited? Stall rest, you know, if a horse is supposed to not move at all, could be he should be hung from a ceiling. If he's supposed to not be moving because he's got broken bones and broken this and totally stressed that, could be you might want to just look into what they used to do more often, which is hang a horse from the ceiling or, and just let him barely touch a treadmill. If it's really that bad, maybe you want to start thinking about swimming him because it's the other end of these types of remedial recommendations that can cause the horse to have to go through the procedure all over again. Okay, I'm not, listen, if there are any veterinarians on here, I don't want anyone to take offense. I'm on your side. Uh, I'm not on anyone else's side, really, except the horse's side and all of you listening and all of whoever else. It's just sometimes you have to be careful because someone's best job could be attached to some sort of brittleness about their worry. Maybe they didn't do right and someone's going to think bad things. If you have made an error with somebody's horse and you're just a well-intended friend, you know, taking care of him for the weekend or you're the highest paid vet in the area. Listen, everybody makes mistakes. The best way to handle that is just to say, I'm sorry, try to do better next time. How can I make it right? You know, if you're going to have brain surgery tomorrow, would you want someone 30 or 65 doing the work? Me, I'd take the older guy because that older guy <clears throat> he might not be real quick on his resume to tell you how many people he's lost, but chances are in a lifetime, you think about, I think about how many horses I've done wrong to and how many, uh, well, maybe one avoidable accident because I didn't have the guts to speak up. I could have avoided that too if I'd had the courage to talk talk back to some people a couple of times. I got horses seriously hurt a couple of times because I couldn't say no. I was younger then. I'd say it now in a minute. And no matter how old you are now listening to this, if in your gut you don't feel right, you feel it's wrong, you can see another way to do things, are you going to go get a second opinion? You don't want to be the one responsible because you know that physically you can tell, by the way, when you're about to get hurt, you know you're not in the right spot. Most of the time you're going to feel it. That I believe. That I really believe. You know when you you should take more time or say no. You should turn down a job or not get on that one, not right then, or maybe do a little groundwork, or maybe make sure that your gear is really, really right. Make sure that horse is really ready to have you up there before you commit the bottom half of yourself to the hot top half of their capacity to unload you when they want to. So these are small things. Much more to say. Oh, look at me here. I've got you right in my nose. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know why. I guess I'm getting cold. 
So I will see you later.